episode of the Epoll Expert Series. And today on episode 10, we will be having a question and answer session uh, today to answer some of the questions that you guys have been sending through to us. And yeah, we are ready to engage with you guys. Um, remember to please continue sending out some questions on our social media pages. We are ready to answer them and we want to make this session as fruitful as possible. Joining me today out of the Eastern Cape is Ndibule Lofunda, better known as Gibbs. We have Sipom Vuyana out of uh, KwaZulu-Natal and as well as Walter Hildebrandt, who's also in uh, KZN. Welcome, gentlemen. So um, we have a couple of questions that were sent through. And then the first question that came through uh, was from Al Algeri uh, Podiba. Apologies if I didn't pronounce that correctly. So the first question is, when we contact you for expert advice, do we have to pay a certain fee? This question goes out to you, uh, Gibbs. What do you have to say? Hi, guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Gibbs, yeah, as Martin has uh, introduced. I think, as I mentioned uh, last week as well, that uh, we do things for Mahala. No briefcase, no brown envelope. If you want to contact us, you can uh, go to our website. Um, where you'll see all the technical advisors, all in different um, areas across the country. You'll find ones in the Eastern Cape, KZN, um, uh, KwaZulu uh, Teng. You also find them in the Western Cape. So we all covered um, in all the areas. All you need to do is just uh, give the guy a call or drop them an email, uh, where you can then you can set up an appointment. The guy could uh, definitely drive down to your farm and come visit you. Or you can uh, meet at, the, at, a, at a good area where you can speak and he can start advising you about everything that you need. As we said, we are the experts of, of the feed, so you won't have to worry about anything. He'll coach you. He'll take you not just um, from the day that you call him, but he will be there uh, when you need him. You'll give him a call, WhatsApp him, send him a call back, um, anything. They are there and they will help. Thanks, Martin. Great input there, Gibbs. Um, just to add there, the contact details is available on our um, website, which is www.epol.co.za. If you go under the Contact Us tab, for every province, there's technical advisors, and you can look at which technical advisor is closest to you, and you can contact them. If you feel uh, much easier to contact a Gibbs or a Sipo, a Walter, or myself, or one of the other experts that you've seen on this series, please do contact them and they will assist you and also refer you to your closest technical advisor. Thank you there, Gibbs. The second question coming in from James King Dube says, for a thousand birds of broilers from starter, grower, and finisher, how many bags on each? And this question, uh, James, I would like to answer to you. So per 100 birds on EPO, be it on the SureGrow, on the Econo, or on the OptiGrow, you need uh, between 600 and 800 grams of feed, and of starter, that is. And that is all dependent on how many days that you feed them. So now, better advised on these days that we advise that you feed starter uh, for about 16 to 18 days, and that's why we say 800 grams. And you need two bags of starter per 100 right and then for your grower you need three bags of grower per hundred and then on your finisher you need three bags of finisher per hundred so i felt that it's best for me to explain on a hundred birds because now you can use that as a multiplier depending on how many boxes you're buying a box has 50 and most likely your distributor will sell you a box of 100 they normally don't split them into 50s or 25s or so on so now knowing that you need two bag starter for uh, 100, and that's a 40 kg bag. And I'm using a 40 kg bag because in all the provinces, that is the bag size that we have available. It's two bag starter per 100, three bags grower per 100, and three bags finisher per 100. And now you can multiply that going back to 1,000. That means you'll need 20 bags starter per 1,000, 20 bags grower, Per, per thousand. Now, if we go on an OptiGrow, you'll use, it's called the finisher phase. It's starter, finisher, post finisher, right? So you use a thousand, thou, um, I said 30 bags uh, grower or finisher on the OptiGrow per thousand and 30 bags post finisher on the OptiGrow or on the Econo. 
is called the finisher per thousand. Do not forget the maintenance or the post finisher phase that you have to feed. If you're selling live birds, you give them 700 grams before slaughter or you give them 700 grams while you're maintaining them. That is supposed to be about maximum of five days that you keep the birds while you're selling them or before you slaughter them. After that, the profit curve diminishes. So please keep close tabs to that. Next question coming in from Busi Mapumulo. And this question will be answered by Mr. Walter. KZN chicken feed comes in 40 kg, but other provinces do 50 kg bags. Walter, why is that? Hi, Martin. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for all the questions that have been coming through. Musi, so to give you an idea, um, in general, in, in the country, EPOL does 40 kg bags. Um, Pretoria, um, Pretoria and, and Rustenburg Mills have, have adapted and they also do a 50 kg. And that was because the market was asking for it. Now, the reason why we do 40 kg bags is a there's a legislative reason to that. Um, so from, from a legislative point of view, um, legislation recommends that you don't carry more than 23 kgs per person, um, per person when you, you're doing manual operations and loading manually. And that's why we went with a 40 kg. So you can have two people that carry 20 kgs each when they're loading. Um, and thus, you are under the recommended rate. Now, like I said, it's a recommendation. It's from a health and safety point of view um, and so to make sure that your employees are, are always safe. And at RCL Foods, we are all about having safe, healthy employees and looking after our employees first. So, um, so that's why they went to 40 kg. Um, because the market cost for a 50 kg, um, a 50 kg bag, we adapted that in Pretoria and Rustenburg, but that also requires that we have more people because at 50 kgs, you're looking at 25 kg per person, which is over that recommended 23 kg per person carrying weight. And thus there, you'd either have people working shorter shifts so that they don't overexert themselves, or you have, instead of two people, you have, have three people loading, loading on the bags. Um, so that's just just from that point of view. Um, and then also our, our prices and our profits on those. I had a question about this a while ago. Um, so whether with a 40 or 50 kg, our, our, our gross margin stays the same. So your price on your 40 kg should be um, the same as the 50 when you take that price divided by 40 multiplied by 50 or vice versa. So your, your price per kg should work out the same. The only time you'd see a difference is when you're comparing sure grow range versus the econo grow range versus the opti grow range so that's where you'll see your differences thank you martin great input from you there walter and it's also just important for us to note that what is important is not the bag size between a 40 and a 50 kilo but the cost per kilogram that you get on the growth benefits. So please use the resources that we have made available for you on our website. I repeat, www.epol.co.za. If you go under the EPOL Experts tab, you'll get all the episodes that we have done thus far, and you'll be able to calculate the feed that you need. And what is important, as I say, is the cost per kilo. So you can buy a 50 kg bag, you can buy a 40 kg bag, on EPOL side, it's still the same cost. It's the a kg times 40 kilo or a kg times 50 kilo. So the important pay aspect is a price per kilo. Great input there given by Walter. So the next question coming through is from Ronsley Abrahams. And Ronsley's question will go to Mr. Sipum Vuyane. And the question is, I have just started a broiler chicken setup with about a thousand broilers. The first batch of 500 are now three weeks old, but weigh about 425 grams maximum. Obviously, they are not eating enough, even though the feed is available at lip. The second batch was delivered a week later, but they seem to have grown as much as the first batch. I'll be, I was feeding, he's been feeding Epol from day one. Sipom Viana, what is your input on that one? Hi, Martin, um, colleagues and the rest of the viewers at home. Um, uh, thanks, Ronsley, for the question. I'm going to try and answer it as open um, as possible to try and, and cover as many of the gaps that could have been the case um, in your situation. Um, maybe it is worth um, noting that at that age, um, Ross 
uh, which is the breeder um, for the Ross 308 uh, broiler strain, they say at, at least about three weeks, your chickens should be sitting at about, call it just below a kg, about 985 grams uh, of live weight. So clearly, um, you have been um, weighing, given the fact that you are able to sort of specify that at that age, you are looking at about 425 grams, which you should be expecting in the region of two weeks and not three weeks. Um, it would be difficult from my side to, to sort of speculate exactly what could be the reason. So I'm going to try and, and maybe bring to your attention a handful of things that you could possibly look at to try and remedy the situation. Um, first of the things that I would like you maybe to consider would be the cheeks themselves. Um, maybe the source of the cheeks, is it a legitimate source? Um, did they use the good quality cheeks? Is it A grade cheeks that you got or is it B grade? Um, you would remember, I think it was episode one when Stefan Jacobs did touch um, quite in depth on, you know, on the quality of the cheeks that you should be looking for and you should be starting your broiler business with. So um, you don't want to sort of start with um, call it B grade cheeks or inferior cheeks. That would be cheeks with sores um, that look unhealthy, that are not quite alert, you know, a dull fake uh, skin color. Um, you know, salivas or um, or anything like that, that that shows that those chickens are not in good um, and healthy uh, condition. So um, from a point of view, if you got them direct from a repeatable supplier, we can maybe tick that and say those chicks are, in, um, you know, are good, great chicks, they're quality chicks, and we expect them to, to perform. So when they arrive on the farm or um, wherever you keep them, could be at home or on the farm, you expect them to have a good starting weight. Um, on average, um, Ross says their chicks, uh, A-grade chicks should be about 42 to 40, call it 45 grams uh, life weight when they arrive on uh, on the farm. Now on the question, I don't hear you or I don't see anywhere where you mention the weights, but I would assume that um, you are quite aware of the fact that any lesser weight would then um, later on in their life, um, you know, give you problems in terms of average uh, weight gain. It is expected that on average, um, as they grow, your chickens more or less at that age would be growing on average about 66 grams um, of life weight a day. Um, so that, that would be uh, the part on the quality of the cheeks. Um, and then we can move over um, to the feed side of things, which could also be a factor um, in, in your situation. Um, the quality of the feed itself, I, I doubt it would be in question. I mean, um, everyone understands the fact that EPOL is, is amongst the leading feed brands in, in the country. So it wouldn't as such be the quality of the feed. However, how you keep your feed, how long your feed have been made, whether it's expired feed or not, that could well come into effect. And the context, uh, I mean, the place within which um, you, 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 you keep your feed would also be effects in, in, in the feed uh, impacting on the growth of your chickens at a later stage. So that would be that. Um, obviously, the, also the amount of feed that you are supplying. Um, I see that you're saying feed has been available at Adlib, which is a good thing, but maybe are the chickens eating it or is it available at Adlib and it's not moving because the chickens are not eating it? And if that's the case, it could well be that uh, the chickens are not quite compatible in, in, in the setup that you have in your chicken house. Um, water quality is also another issue. Quite often we focus on the quality of the feed and we neglect the quality of the water. So if you don't have the cool, um, safe and drinkable water for your chickens, then you might well have chickens sitting with the feed and not consuming it. And you might assume that because feed is there 24 seven, chickens should then be able to eat it, which is not always the case. So what's happening on the feed side, uh, on the water side could actually affect the consumption on the feed side. And if either water or feed is not consumed in the right quantities, you might have an issue getting um, to the right weight. And um, also one other thing could well be the amount of feeders and drinkers that you have um, in, in your chicken house as well. If you have less um, feeders um, and drinkers, you might actually run into issues where some of the chickens are quite bossy and they're able to eat slightly more than the others or they chase others which, which are trying to eat and drink, which could um, cause a bit of a, a flock um, uniformity problem in your chicken house as well. So I would, I would also advise you to, to look into whether do you have the right quantities in terms of feeders and drinkers, the right quality of feed and the right quantities of feed supplied to your chicken and the right quality of feed in terms of is it still in, in you know, fresher feed that would still deliver maximum results um, from the feed point of view. And then, of course, we move on to, to management issues as well, um, temperatures and humidity. Um, higher temperatures, higher humidities tend to make your chickens to be quite uncompatible in the chicken house. 
Um, and as a result, they'll tend to eat less, even though feed is made available. And you would assume that feed is there, it's not being used, um, or it's there because it's at leap, whereas um, actually those chickens are being stressed by something else. Stress levels could also be another issue, um, whether it's noise, whether it's movement, whether it's, it's large sound, sudden movements and all of that, that could well be a factor, you know, to, to your chickens eating less and growing less. Ventilation is another issue as well. Um, if you have stuffed um, A, um, you know, less circulation, uh, ammonium buildup, you know, wet litter and all of that, all of that could well be the reason why your chickens are not comfortable in that setup and as such um, also impact uh, on the growth of your chickens. Um, and then stocking density, if, if you stocking more than you should be, you know, per square meter in the chicken house, you might also run into, into growth issues as well. Um, you would recall, I think it was episode two of the Apple Expect series where we did recommend that your stocking density for a manually operated house would range anything between 12 beds per square meter to about 15 beds per square meter. So maybe if you could please confirm that for us and make sure that you have the right stocking density such that there's enough space, um, you know, for your chickens to grow and um, to look healthy as well. And obviously, um, you'd also have health, um, you know, general health issues and diseases, which from our point of view, we can only point you in the direction. But um, to get accurate help, you would need to have consulted with someone who have a better understanding on animal health uh, and diseases side of things. Um, I hope I've, I've touched, um, you know, many of the key points. I'm not sure if any of my colleagues would like to add. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe uh, wrap it and bring it back to Martin back in studio. Sipo doing exactly that, leaving no stone unturned. I feel like, Sipo, you've mentioned everything that uh, Ronsley Abrahams was asking about. And if there's more that we are unclear about, Ronsley, you're more than welcome to contact Sipo to have maybe a one-on-one -on -one discussion. And also, depending on which province and which area you're in, uh, maybe we can get a technical advisor out to your farm to do a bit of troubleshooting and then assist in looking at how we can improve your farm or your setup through um, EPO. So the next question that came in and it will be answered by Walter is from Sibunelo Hatebe. And Sibunelo uh, asked that as a small scale farmer, which methods to use for slaughtering? Keeping in mind that uh, one can't afford the big machines. I know Walter, you've been in amongst a couple of few setups where they use all types of methods. What is your view on uh, Sibunelo's question? Thank you, Martin. Hi, Sibonelli. I think this is a, a difficult one to answer from uh, just a straightforward point of view. So I'm going to break it up into two sections. First being legislative, the second being um, more from a practical how to slaughter point of view. So I'm going to start with the second one. Um, so, I mean, there, there, there's a whole variety of ways of slaughtering chickens, um, starting from the stunning all the way through. Um, so, like you mentioned, not the big machine. So, me most big companies um, have got a water bath electrical stunning uh, method where they stun the chickens. So, all it does is it puts the chicken to sleep and then, then they cut the throat, the throat, the animal bleeds out, the blood pressure drops and they kind of just never wake up again. So, very humane, not a painful method. They, ha they hung upside down. Now, if you've ever worked with a chicken, if you hang it upside down, you'll see they just chill and they sort of almost just fall asleep. Um, so, so that's how the big big corporate companies do it. Uh, at Vasti, we had a little stunner. Um, it's literally a thing that just goes under the chin here and it just puts the chicken to sleep. Um, and then once they're asleep, you can cut the throat, bleeds out, and then you can start slaughtering. Um, I mean, all the way through. So with chickens, obviously different to all anim other animals, you keep the skin on with the chicken. You just defeather it, keep the the um, the skin on, and then you take out the, the insides and all of that. Um, so the second point, or which was actually more, I mentioned it first, but is a legislative part, part of this whole thing. So what's what's interesting is if you're going to slaughter for yourself there's no problem i mean then there's no legislation that predicts how you can slaughter for yourself i mean it's at home whatever how you want to do it and if you're going to be slaughtering for sale there's quite strict legislation from a feed and safety point of view 
um, that you'd have to follow. Now, you get everything from a massive abattoir that's registered as an abattoir, all the way through to what they call a bush abattoir, um, or a, a small-scale abattoir, where you, you slaughter for a small market, but you slaughter and you sell either frozen or fresh or whichever. Um, but all of those require that you are registered as an abattoir, that you are trained as a a feed safety officer or a meat inspector so that you can make sure when you're selling the meat that there's nothing wrong with it, um, no infections, no anything, which is something you don't often find with chickens, um, especially broilers, but just from a, a safety point of view. So so I hope that that sort of answered your question um, that you've placed, but obviously it'd, it'd be a lot easier if we knew what what's your end goal with this. If you're slaughtering to sell, there's quite a bit of legislation that you would go through that also predicts how you can and can't slaughter. Um, and then if you're slaughtering for yourself, there's not that much legislation and then it's as easy as putting the chicken to sleep and then, uh, and then slitting its throat and bleeding it out and then you can slaughter it from there onwards. Um, but again, um, for, for more specific, like Martin always says, please feel free to give us a shot um, and we'll try and help you as best we can. Obviously, we're not abattoir or meat, uh, meat specialists or safety officers or meat inspectors, um, but we will try as much as we can to help you. Back to you, Martin. Walter, thank you very much uh, for your input. I'm sure Sibunelo appreciates it. And it's very important uh, what you mentioned is that uh, from a technical advice point of view, we are experts when it comes to feed and feed performance when it comes to your livestock. But as well, we are very willing to assist and give advice as far as our knowledge goes. So please do get in contact, uh, Sibunela, with uh, Walter if you would like to just have or extend that conversation. And as he said, he's more than willing to assist. And then the next question coming in is from Ellen Mukau. And this question will be answered by Gibbs. The question is, how long should I keep my chicken while on finisher feed? Gibbs, I know you have experience, uh, lo a lot of experience when it comes to finisher yourself. What is your input to uh, Ellen Mukau? Hi guys, um, thanks Martin, thanks for the question. Um, so Ellen, I don't want to confuse you guys uh, too much because what happens is that in different regions, we depending on what range you're using, so it, they could be a different in terms of um, the different phases that you are feeding your chickens. So for example, in, in the Eastern Cape, Western Cape and KZN areas, you will also in, uh, in, the, in Pretoria, you will get a, uh, a range where it's an update an opti, an opti range where you will feed the starter, finisher, and post finisher. Then in inland, in more of the inland areas, you'll get different ranges where you can get the econo or the show grow, where it will have a starter, grower, a finisher, or post finisher. So I just want don't want to get you guys uh, too um, confused on that, just to so that I, I can I can answer your question as best as I can. So the, let's talk about the Optigro um, finisher here yeah, in the in the in the coastal regions. So the finisher, you should at least uh, uh, feed your chickens from day 19 to day 36. That's how long you should be feeding your finisher. And remember, the finisher is actually one of also one of the most important uh, ranges that you need to actually feed your chickens because that's where uh, your buildup of of your meat and and it has a lot of protein in it so that you can build your meat. Um, in your chickens, and you and you know that once we get to the time where you have to change your range, where you 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 you're waiting for the time where you're going to slaughter your chickens, that your your chickens are full and they are able, and you you've got your your kilograms that you need when you're going to sell your chickens. So you need it's very important that you you use that finisher. I know most of the people have experience where they'll uh, use the finisher range and then they won't go into the post finisher range. That's actually uh, not the way you should be using it because you also need to go to your post finisher range because your post finisher range is is the difference between them is that they don't have much uh, they don't have medicines in it so there needs to be a withdrawal uh, period of those medications in in terms of when you're gonna sell your chickens so you actually need to also use your post finisher it's very important and your post finisher also acts as uh, as a maintenance so that you maintain your chickens while you're getting them ready in terms of to slaughter or you sell them as, as your live birds. So you do need to also, uh, the post finish is quite important. Just uh, going to the you know, inland areas, um, also maybe on the corner range, there is where they call it a grower um, on, on the phase. The grower works 
uh, basically the same as a finisher. You need to also uh, feed it um, from uh, nine uh, from nineteen to about thirty six days, depending on how long you're growing your chickens. So it's also quite important where they call it the grower. Again, they'll they come questions here in the EC and they ask in the EC why or don't you guys have the grower? So I'm feeding starter and grow, uh, for feeding starter finisher. Then that's the <coughs> end. That's where I'm supposed to leave it. No, no, no. You go all the way to your post finisher, so it doesn't end there. So that's why I'm saying it's quite important that you do when you go to the to to your local um uh, uh, reseller places. You do ask them to show you that um which 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 uh, um, I want to feed uh, my broiler birds. Where from, from? Where should I go from the start to finish? And they can help you, and they will uh, definitely give you the advice. Or you can get in contact with your uh, expert advisor, and they'll also advise you in terms of um, uh, how to use it. Uh, whether you're using the starter, whether you're using the finisher, or the post finisher, you need to complete that whole um, phase in order for you then to be ready to 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 sell the chickens. So that's why I'm saying also in, in the inland areas, the grower very important. Uh, you need to feed it as well. You need, you need to, uh, as I said, you, you keep it for there for those for those days, and you feed your chickens so that they can get um, fully um, ready for the market in terms of so that you can make your profits and and you can get uh, as much profits as possible, and you can sell it uh, to your market. Uh, thanks, Martin. Over to you. Gibbs, a great input that you gave there, and remember, uh, Ellen, if you go on. Uh, Google and you just type in EPO broilers. One of the first few tabs, I think it might be first or second, is the broiler EPO broiler guide. It's a PDF file, and in that e a PDF file, you find all the necessary information that you need and also feeding recommendations. And remember as well, on the feedback tags, we also have feeding information available. So Gibbs has given you some inputs from his side. You have the EPO broiler PDF file. You can Google it. That's the first thing you'll find. You have the EPO experts tab on our uh, website, which is www.epo.co.za. You'll get more information around that. And you have your friend in EPO, your technical advisor, that you can contact for more information. Thank you, listeners. This is the first half of the Q&A session. Please stay tuned for a couple of seconds. We'll be right back, continuing with more question and answers. Stay tuned. back welcome back listeners to episode 10 of the EPOL expert series and we are very honored to have you here with us uh, in our question and answer session as i said joining me today is in dibulele funda better known as gibbs out in the eastern cape and then in kzn we have walter hildebrandt and sipo mvuyani joining us on this very informative q a session of the EPOL expert series so the next question, which will be answered by Volta Hildebrandt himself, comes from Musa Msomi. And the question is, it was my first time using EPO feed, so I'm experiencing bees. How do you chase them away? They're affecting the growth and stressing my chicks. Uh, Walter, I've seen this couple of, a couple of my clients also had a problem with this. What is your input when it comes to that? Thank you, Martin. I'm sorry. Um, it's, that is a, it is an interesting question, something we have seen in the past. Um, I have to be honest, I, I, I'll have to get some more info from you, but uh, the majority of the times I've seen it was on um, layers and especially free range layers where they use a meal or a mash, whichever way you want to call it. Um, but but then, especially this time of year, there are not a, a lot of flowers that are, are flowering, not a lot of pollen available, so that the bees tend to go to whatever is sweetest. Um, and unluckily that you find in, in the maze. There's not much alpha else in the feed that can attract bees it's probably only the maize um, and that's why i'm saying you mainly see it in a meal form um, we don't often see it in pellets 
Um, how to deal with it? I have to be honest. Um, I'm not much of a bee expert, to be completely honest about that one. Um, I wouldn't necessarily chase them away. Um, they do get quite aggressive, and the sting is quite, uh, uh, you know, you'll know when they sting you. Um, so, so I have to be honest, again, whether it's an open, open system or closed system, you could probably put out a, like a, a fly trap or something that's got something sweet in it, say a trap with, with sugar water or something to trap the bees in there. Just make sure that you don't have, if it is in a chicken house, a normal broiler house, that you don't have a bee a beehive somewhere close or maybe even in the roof or so on. So just check at that and then you, you get guys who come and move those. Um, and utilize the bees for honey and put them somewhere else. Um, but but for the rest of it, uh, I, I wish I could give you more answer. Maybe something to consider is, is a bit of a side hustle. Um, get yourself a beehive, put it somewhere, move the bees into the beehive, and then you can start trading honey. Um, very healthy and also very sought after. You can get good money for honey if, you, if you're putting it out. And also you're helping the environment. Bees pollinate uh, trees, flowers, all of those things, which is very healthy. So, yeah. Um, if, if you've got more, please give me a contact and I'd love to see whether we can work something out. Thanks, Martin. Walter, great input. What you said there is that bees normally follow something sweet. And it's quite confusing because I don't have bees following me. But uh, nonetheless, great input that you gave there, Walter. And then the next question coming in from Chris Swartz. And the question is... Uh, or rather, let's take the question from Q Goodman Mkwanazin Nkosikona. Apologies if I didn't pronounce it right. My chicks are 11 days old today. Can I give them hello? Vianne, I think this question is best suited for you. What is your input, sir? Joman, um, yes, man. Um, I think straight answer would be yes. Uh, but I, I also need to add... Um, there hasn't really been any scientifically documented, um, you know, uses of aloe or more so aloe vera um, in, in, in the context of broiler farming. Um, so much of what we go by is traditional uh, or indigenous knowledge. Um, and from, from what we understand, um, having, you know, grown up in the Sasab where we've been using aloe for ages, um, it's safe to give to your to your chickens even earlier than 11 days. But straight to the answer, yes, um, there shouldn't be any uh, side effects to that. That's good, and that's straight to the answer coming in from Mvuyana. Uh, Mr. Goodman, um, or rather, I'm not sure if it's a male or female. Apologies on that. You can also contact Mr. Mvuyana if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion when it comes to the topic of aloe. I'm sure there's some research that has been done, and I'm sure that he'll be able to give you a bit more input regards to that. But also remember, there is also traditional, or rather, um, formally produced um, vitamins and additives and medication that has been made it available for you in the market that you can also make use of. But that's a discussion that we can have. Please do get in contact with us um, for more, for more um, uh, inputs coming in from us. So the next question coming in from Mr. Swartz um, is, um, I see that one second uh, day you put down feeders and drinkers. And after that, you have a f to fumigate again. Is that wise as a residue from fumigation made lion feeders and drinkers? So I'll repeat that question. It came in from Chris Swartz. Chris asked, I see that on the second day, you put down feeders and drinkers. After that, you have to fumigate again. Is that wise as residue from fumigation made lion the feeders and drinkers. I'll just give an input on that, uh, Chris. So what is important is that on day of slaughter or when you're done selling your chickens, you have to follow the steps of cleaning your house. So if you go back to the beginning is on the first day, you want to clear your house, um, get out all the bedding, uh, sweep it clean, make sure that you sweep the walls and you sweep thoroughly sweep through the house. And it's always best to use those industrial brooms that you'll normally use for, um, that you normally use to sweep streets and pavements and so on, which cleans very well. That's what you use. And then after that, you thoroughly spray that area or the cage. You want to spray clean, make sure that you spray all the corners going up to the top. Obviously, you're doing it in a safe manner that you switched off your, your switchboards so that there's no electrical supply to that house and you spray it clean. Thirdly, um, you use disinfectant and soap um, to clean your house and scrub it. You can use that same broom that you use to sweep it 
to scrub that house and not just scrubbing the floor. You want to scrub the walls. You want to go up the walls because, listen, you want to make sure there's no residue of any bacteria that can stay there and stay active. And you want to make sure that you're preparing your house for your next, next cycle and for it to be as safe as possible. Then after that, you let the house dry. It normally is for a day or two, depending on how hot the weather is outside. On a colder day, it might take up to three days to let the house dry completely. Once completely dry, you fumigate, right? You fumigate the house and you let it stand for a day. After standing for a day, open your curtains again for a bit of ventilation coming through. You place your bedding, you place your drinkers and you place your feeders. Right. And then what other farmers have done, what we see in the field is then they won't won't rather, I won't say fumigate, because if you fumigate, you must you might use a harsh substance. But then they go through a disinfection process where you use a more uh, less harsh or less harmful disinfectant to spray over not directly onto your bedding, not directly onto your drinkers and feeders, but it's more just dis uh, distributed into the air of the cage and it settles onto the onto your space. And that is to help uh, clear out any uh, bacteria that may have came in with your bedding or any residue that you have forgot uh, that you didn't touch on when you were scrubbing the cage. And then you let it stand again, and that's how you start now preparing for the brooding period, heating up your house. Um, making sure that it's 32 degrees plus to put in your day old chicks. So um, on the other, on the day before placements, once you've once you've placed your your bedding, your drinkers and feeders, you don't fumigate as such, but it's more of a disinfectant. Because why I use those words specifically is because you want to make use of a less harm substance um, to line the drinkers or feeders, as Chris has said. I don't know, gentlemen, um, Walter, Sipo, uh, Gibbs, any of you have an input there? Um, um, not from my side. No, Martin. Also, you've I think you've covered pretty much everything on that one. Um, I just want to want to add, um, Chris. You asked about whether it settles and there's residue. Um, understand where your question is coming from, but I've gone through a lot of our bef between commercial farmers and all of that, and there's no effect on the performance of the chicken. If there was harmful residue, you'd see it in the performance. Um, of the chickens and the challenge of that. So, so I don't think there's there's too much. But like Martin said, um, just just make sure with with your your either your chick supplier or or your vet um, to see what 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 could be too harmful or what could be too harsh, and just use a, a light disinfectant um, when you when you do that last disinfection. Hundred percent. Thank you very much. There. Gibbs, you have anything? No, I think you've covered that quite perfectly, Martin. I don't think I'll have anything uh, to add on that. But that's just that from the from also the smaller guys that it's, it's really important to um, really have a clean out um, period um, during um, when you're going to place uh, different flocks. And uh, you must have a proper clean out and cleaning, um, washing the, the walls, washing uh, your your feeders, your drinkers, um, taking them, taking out all the equipment and just making sure the house also there's also definitely needs to be a rest period also once you've cleaned out the house. So those are things that are very important in terms of um, any infectious diseases or bacterial um, um, things that could stay over and affect um, your, your flock that you'll be putting in your new flock. Thanks, Martin. What you said there, Gibbs, is very important. And just a word of caution to the farmers is that do not rush to place your next cycle. You want to thoroughly do what Gibbs just has said, the clean out and resting period of your house. You want to eliminate any chance of bacteria or viruses remaining active within your houses so that your biosecurity has a tick, a green mark that you well taken care of, and then you place your next cycle. So it's very, very, very important to follow that process. So the next question coming in from Ranzu Nyati Maluleke. And this question is also based to you, um, Sipo Mviana, is which type of aloe is good for chickens and when they are sick? Sipo, I think uh, these aloe questions uh, seem to follow you. Uh, please uh, do put your input to Ranzu. Of, of course it does. And knowing you, Martin, you'll end up calling me Mr. Alu, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, man, um, jokes aside, um, as long as it's alu, it will work. Um, there is the one, though, that Growing up, that we used to use, um, it could well be the issue of um, the, the case coming from the south coast down in Pochepstein. The one would call it thicker leaves, um, quite prominent um, 
thorns there as well. That's the one that we are used to. But in, in, in theory, as long as it's alu, it should it should be able to work. And just to add there, um, you know, to for some viewers and listeners who, who are confused about this conversation, because it started call it about a year or so ago and it's gaining momentum. Um, I, I think we've we've gotten to a to um, a specific period in the broiler production where um, people are becoming more and more conscious about what goes into their feed and ultimately into their chickens. Um, and there's a lot of um, you know um, conversations around synthetic antibiotics and 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 um, and growth promoters versus natural um, you know um, agents that can be used. And I think alu is is featuring prominently as a natural antibiotic and a, and a growth promoter. Um, and some have gone as far as arguing um, the fact that it has some some um, curing, um, you know, um, call it elements to it as well. I mean, um, there's quite a handful of um, health issues that can be covered by by administering alu as opposed to any commercial or synthetic uh, produced um, antibiotics and, and that sort of thing. So it is within that context that this question keeps, um, you know, um, coming up. But to, to wrap up, um, you know, if it's alu, it should be able to work. Um, th See, thank you, Martin. I'm not sure if I've, if I've addressed it quite correctly and uh, vividly. Uh, Sipo, you've you've um, answered that perfectly. And I'd just also like to encourage Ranzu to please do your research, read a bit, go Google some um, of the answers or questions that you have. It's always good to engage with a farmer once they've done their research and be able to ask leading questions. It makes our session much more fruitful uh, to engage and advise you accordingly. So Ranzu, thank you very much for that question. And I believe Sipo's answer has covered a lot of the questions that come about around ILO. And I like that Sipo went about taking it from back to when he grew up and how it was traditionally used in his setup and how it is now being maybe seen as a natural uh, more of, uh, of product or rather that you can use use um, to, to, to heal or promote the growth of your chickens and so on. Great input that you've given there, Sipo. So uh, a question has came in from Wieland Rautenbach. That is, what is the process to become a commercial chicken farmer as to how to get a contract and the steps to take, et cetera, et cetera? This question came through while we on the session. And thank you very much for Wieland for that question. And I'll assign it uh, to Voter. Oh, yeah, Walter Hildebrand. Apologies there, Walter, please. That's not a problem. Thank you, Martin. Vilant, um, yes, to answer your question, it's not a straightforward answer. Um, it's not a bit, I mean, obviously, we've done a whole series as to people experts. So my advice would be, if you have never done broiler farming, start small and pay your school fees on a small scale. Um, paying school fees on a on 10, 40,000 bird houses is going to cost you a lot of money. So you learn the lessons needed to be learned um, at small scale, and then you take it from there, um, and then you grow into it. If you are a broiler producer um, and you've already got houses, so most of the contract grows depending on who you go with, um, but I'm thinking of the big ones. So, so for example, Astral, Rainbow, um, even, even uh, Riverside, there, there are a few others, but the big ones, depending on whether they're looking for free range or a, um, well, call it a normal commercially produced uh, uh, broiler, um, you'll have to, each one of them has got their own set of rules. Um, the ones I can talk for, for are, for example, Rainbow or Astral, the big, big guys who do supply uh, supermarkets and so on. Um, what they require is a, a brand new setup that's got automated housing, that's got um, state-of-the-art feeders, that's got all of that because they are after efficiency. So in essence, to answer your question in short, what does it require? It requires a lot of capital expenditure. So it's usually that initial cost is very big. You're looking at Usually they put up about six houses, call it five to seven houses um, that run at about between 20 and 40,000 birds each. So you're looking at about 2 million rand per house. So you're looking at a, a capital expenditure of between 10 and 15 million rand. So you're looking at a lot of money that you have to put in. Um, and like I said, they are very specific as to how they want it done. 
um, as well as they look at people who need advice. Now, the, uh, who've already got experience, that's what I mean, not who need advice. Um, and also, there are vets in it. They've got their own, a lot of these integrated companies have got vets. They've got uh, nutritionists, as we are. Um, and then they've got, they've got advisors that they can use. But the main thing that they need is land and they need uh, money from your side to put up and then you go from there and do the contract. So it depends on who you want to do the contract with and what they require. But um, but I would I would rather try and push for a, a personal a personal thing where you do your own business um, and you sell from there onwards. Um, once you start going the contract grower route, you start playing in a different game. It, um, that that contract looks a lot different, and you get you get uh, assessed on efficiency every single cycle. And if your efficiency is not where it should be, it costs you a lot of money in the end. Um, so yeah, again, sorry for the high level answer, but um, but each company has their own um, yeah own things that they want out of it. So Martin, I don't know if there's anything else. No, uh, Walter, you have really answered this question. I think uh, Vinan can just make contact with you if you'd like to have a discussion on the site to get more information of um, more a discussion, open the conversation with you um, uh, to just uh, broaden that, that, that answer. But thank you very much there uh, for your question. And then the last one that came through from Sipo Ponzi, and I'll, sign, I'll assign this answer as well to Sipo Mvuyane. Um, I want to start a broiler business should I buy dough old chicks or old ones, assuming that this is older than seven days or 14 days? Mr. Mviani, what is your view on this? Martin, um, thanks for the question. And um, thanks, my namesake there, Sipo, um, for the question. Um, I think it, it is not for us to, to give answers, you know, to, to such questions without you know, having or understanding um, what the farmer wants to achieve or what the business person in this context wants to achieve. Um, you know, whether you buy the old or you buy all the chickens, um, it, it needs to be to be answered within the context of what needs to be achieved. Um, le let me make an example. Um, if, if you go for day old chicks, um, you need to have a thorough understanding of how to grow day old chicks up to a point where they're ready for the market and you're able to sell them. Um, you also need to at least be in a position to gather all the resources required um, so that you can successfully raise your chickens from day old um, to, to, to market weight. Um, and that obviously, you know, comes with a lot of um, capital investment, capital outlay in terms of infrastructure, feed, um, medication, um, you know, the works that goes into, into producing the chicken. Um, that versus if you buy them in and then sell them, it then becomes a question of how much profit do I make? Um, if, if I make enough profit buying and selling um, and, and I can turn more stock buying and selling and I don't need as much space um, in, in doing so, then why buy day old? You know, but if my if my passion is in is in growing chickens and I know for a fact that in doing so I can do it efficiently and make more money growing chickens, then your answer would be go for day old chicks. But um, I, I cannot, you know, I cannot without proper context and understanding of um, of what or why the question is being asked, um, then say go for day old or go for older ones. It's all dependent on the business model and it all, it's all dependent on whether you're passionate growing chickens or you're passionate about selling chickens. I, I, I think in, in a nutshell, um, you know, a business plan needs to be in place and it needs to, it to clearly outline the objectives and, and um, the routes that will be followed to achieve objectives. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Mr. Mviani, for that output. Um, but uh, Sipo Ponzi, if you'd like a bit more information or maybe rather to direct the answer, to get a more consistent answer, a more direct answer from Mr. Mviani, please do feel free to contact him. Like I said, you can go onto our website. Under the contact tab, you'll find Mr. Mviani's contact details there. You can mail him or you can give him a shout and you guys will be able to just to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion and uh, for him to give you a, a more answer directly to more what you'd like to achieve. 
And uh, that is that from us today. We've been having some questions coming through um, while we were discussing and we've answered those. And I'd please like to encourage our farmers and our viewers to <coughs> please continue asking questions on our social media pages. Send us uh, an inbox on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter. Please communicate with us or go on the on our contact tab on our, on our website and make contact with us and we will assist you as far and as best we can. I'd like to th say thank you to Ndiblelo Funda, better known as Gibbs, for joining us today. I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Sipum Viana for always sharing his knowledge as easy and as truthful and as honest and as great as he can. And thank you to Walter for also uh, giving his time to assisting our farmers. And like I said, viewers, please do make contact with us. We are more than willing to assist you. And we're going to keep this as an open forum, an open forum of communication. Talk to us, engage with us, and we will assist you in becoming that EPOL experts that you deserve to be. Thank you very much and talk again soon.